Yehudahata. We're going to continue with what we left off last time, where we spoke about line from Perk Yavos about the world stands on three things. Torah, Avodah, Gemelz Chasadim, which is Torah, divine service, basically, and deeds of kindness. The way this applies for the macrocosm, it applies to the, to the microcosm as well. The macrocosm is the world. The world stands on three things. A person stands on three pillars as well. What does this have to do with anything? Because if you remember the way that this whole mimer, this whole discourse started by saying, Yehuda, your brothers are going to acknowledge you. So it doesn't mean your brothers are going are to acknowledge you. So we have that simple explanation of that Yehuda was going to be the tribe of kings. So he's the leader and everyone's going to acknowledge you. But we have it in the realm of divine service in that we have to go through the paths of service of the brothers to get to the service of Yehuda. They set us up for that. Why? Because this path of Yehuda is so high it's such a higher level. The other brothers are the rungs in the ladder along the way to get into this level of Yehuda. So we got to this whole thing about how the world stands on three things. The macrocosm of the world stands on three things, the microcosm and the man. So how does this apply to the man? There's a lot of different explanations for this. In this particular case, the way that this fits is that each of the brothers stand for one of those pillars. As in Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, the first three brothers. So we look at Reuven. Which pillar is he? He is the pillar of Gemil Chasadim. The pillar of, of good deeds, kindness. Going back, we said that Reuven is the pathway of love. Love is the cause and essence of kindness. Where does kindness stem from? It stems from love, a sense of givingness, openness, which parallels love. Taking this a step further, it's not just that kindness is, is rooted in a sense of love, but also one who loves God also loves a fellow Jew, who contains a spark of God. Every single person, they have a soul. Here specifically, we're talking about the Jewish people. Every Jew has a spark of God within them, the divine soul. They never shall kiss, but it's the divine spark that every single person has. We've done, obviously, a with Tanya already about do you place more importance on the body or on the soul and that sort of stuff. But here, just because you have a spark of God within you, this is a pathway of love of God. I love God so much. God's in you. I love you also. That's the angle of approach here. So it's sort of the same thing, but it's, we're just approaching it from a different angle. Because the whole thing with Ruvain is, look, I have a son. When you look at closeness, closeness is... Seeing and closest is love, etc. You know, seeing God in our lives, and that brings about love. But I love you so much, I want to do for you. So here it's saying, the same way you love God so much, person has, has a spark of God in them. I love you so much as well. And we have these two. These are actually both, both from Hayom Yom. So Hayom Yom is a book that the Rebbe, the Seventh Lubavitch Rebbe, put together. We say the Rebbe is the author of it, and a lot of what it is, though, is a compilation of different teachings that he got from his father-in-law. It says, my father said, so the previous Rebbe is talking about his father who's the fifth Chabad Rebbe. It sometimes just gives specifics about different things. They'll talk about maybe a particular, like, you know, the way we do this mitzvah or that mitzvah. But a lot of times there's stories or teachings in it. And Hayom Yom means like day to day. So like every day there's another one that you learn. This is the way we're going to start our day with this. We have two of them. One is from the month of Nisan. One's from the month of Av. This is from, I think, the month of Av, the first one. It says, Dr. the Rebbe repeated what the Mezrich Magid said, according to the Baal Shem Tov. So when you look at the dynasty of the Chabad Rebbe's, Hasidus in general, the father of Hasidus, the way it came for all people and was just a select group of people learning it, that's the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was the first. The Baal Shem Tov had a disciple, and he was the Magid. He was called the Magid of Mezrich. He was the one who officially took over as leader. The way that you have now, that you have all these different like Hasidic sects, that all started around there, because it was all their disciples who spread out and went to their own towns and cities and stuff, and started the folks on a certain pathway of service, rooted in the teachings of, of Hasidus. From the Balshanto, from the Magid, etc. The Balshanto, the Magid, and then the Magid officially gave over the, the leadership to the Alter Rabbi after that. Even though at that point, there were many more leaders at that point also, which is all the other disciples focusing on their own pathways. The Alter Rabbi was specifically, what pathway was he specifically? Is Chabad Hasidus, from the intellect to control the heart, for love and fear of God, etc. The Alter Rabbi repeated what the Mizritra Magid said, quoting the Balshanto. Going back one generation, one generation. They're all saying it in the name of, of the Rebbe who came before them. He says, love your fellow like yourself, as in, love your neighbor as yourself, is an interpretation of and commentary on love Hashem, your God. Interpreting that, commentating is that, is that love your fellow like yourself. Why is that? Because he who loves his fellow Jew loves God. Because the Jew has within himself a part of God above. It's the divine soul that's within us. Therefore, when one loves the Jew, i.e. his inner essence, one loves God. So when I love a fellow Jew, when I love the real you, not just all the external part that gets a little bit yucky sometimes, but I love the real you, who you really truly are, which is your soul is who you truly, really truly are, your essence is who you truly are. I'm not just loving you, I actually love God himself. Why? Because you have a part of God within you. Building on that, we have Hasidim asked the Alter Rebbe, which is the superior voda? Here referring to the divine service. Love of God or love of Israel? 
which one ranks higher, loving God or loving fellow Jew? So he replied, both love of God and love of Israel, as in of the Jewish people, are equally engraved in every Jew's neshama, ruach, and nefesh, three of the five levels of the soul. Scripture is explicit. I have loved you, says the Lord. That's actually from Navi. After have to ask Marshem. It follows that love of Israel is superior for your love whom your beloved loves. When we talk about what is this pillar of Reuven, we say we have three pillars that the world stands upon. One of them is the pillar of of good deeds, deeds of kindness, specifically what Torah dictates as deeds of kindness. Where does that come from? It comes from love, which now we see, oh, maybe that's why this is the pillar of Reuven. Love is the root of, of kindness because it's giving this openness and warmth and all that sort of stuff. We can see how the world could be sustained by, by deeds of kindness. We see how that could keep a civilization together, a society together. We see how that could uphold the world. How does that apply to me specifically? So on the one hand, deeds of kindness, that's the pillar within you on the microcosmic level. A second level, looking at this specifically, this is the pathway of Reuben. Love of God. How does that manifest? Deeds of kindness. What does that mean? Loving a fellow Jew. Because a fellow Jew has a spark of God within him. So if you love God, you love the fellow Jew. I love you. You have a spark of God. And I love God so much. And not just that, the Alter Rebbe says it's superior even to love of God. Because when I love you so much, I'm going to love what you love. That's going to be my full expression of love for you. And not just how I'm going to put up with your, like, like your quirky habits. This is something that's so important to you. Well, it's going to be important to me too. That's what the elder is saying. This means a lot to you. Well, now it means a lot to me too. I didn't think it did, but now I know it does. And even if I don't really get it, but it means so much to you. It's not because of whatever the thing itself is. It's the meaning it holds to you that that creates meaning within me as well. Fellow Jew, we say, oh, this, he has a spark of God. He has a soul, da -da, whatever. Yes, but because I love God so much, and I know how much God loves the Jewish people so much. Here we're specifically talking about the Jewish people. We know that. We know God chose us and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, all these things. Because I, I love God so much and I know how much he loves the Jewish people, I love somebody else as well. And this is superior because this is a full expression of our love for God. We can show the full extent of our love for God by loving what he loves as well. That's the pillar of Uvin. Now we're going to the next pillar. The next pillar, if you see the original phrase from Pergamos, we're actually moving, it listed in one direction, then we're moving backwards through it. The service of God, which is divine service. So that's the pillar of Shimon. That's why it's at the left side. It's right, left, and center. What is Avoda? We use this word Avoda. Avoda literally means work. We still use it in modern Hebrew. But when we're speaking about this on a deeper level, work means the divine service. We've kind of gone through this before that the word for Avoda stems from the word of Berta or something like that. It comes from the expression of tanning hides. Work a skin to make it uh, usable, an animal hide. And it's tanning a hide because you got to work for it. you got to break a sweat. When we talk about in divine service, what does this mean specifically? We're specifically talking about prayer. Why prayer? Because prayer is related to self-refinement, self-discipline, focusing on different aspects of ourself and making it better and making it more. That's the pillar of Shimon because that's the pillar of fear. Fear, discipline, etc. It all it goes together. It's all rooted in fear of God, withholding, self-discipline. It's not givingness. It's not love and givingness. It's fear, it's withholding, it's self-refinement, self-discipline. Prayer is related to discipline, specifically acting to act opposite the soul's inclination. Soul's inclination is in, that's specifically going to be your animal soul. The Nebuchadnezzar Bahamas, the natural soul. It's like, hey, let's go, let's go for a pool party now. And I'm like, wait, but I didn't dive in yet. Oh, no, it's okay. We'll go for a pool party first. It's a long day. You'll catch up. And I'm like, no, 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 wait. This we definitely know from Tanya. We can act contrary to how we actually feel. Especially today, they're like, no, you can't do that, right? Nobody today talks like that. So like, no, give it to your feeling, give it to your feeling. It's like, really? What if I'm not in the mood of going to somebody's a wedding, but you got to go to the wedding? So what gets you show up to the wedding? Well, because I know the wedding's important and this is this is my sister, my cousin, my best friend, or whatever. So what, you show up and like what? Now you're not, well, I'm not expressing my truth because I showed up to the wedding even though I didn't want to. Really? Just, nobody talks like that. Look, you might be in a bad mood right now, but it's not about you right now. It's about the person who we're, whose celebration we're, we're partaking in. You enhance the celebration by being there, especially if you're not in your grumpy pants mood. But I don't want to. Well, too bad. So that's why also people sometimes think like, oh, how can we act contrary to how we truly feel? Like you do that all the time. We actually do that all the time. When you think about it like that, you realize it might not necessarily be easy, but yeah, we do that all the time. And then we see that, okay, I can actually see why it's better to behave in that kind of manner. In the sense that, because if not, then you'd miss out. How much would you be missing out on? How much would you not be participating in? How many times would you not be going to work, not be doing what you got to be doing? What, you're sitting in your house all day with plates of macaroni stacked around you, and then there's roaches and rats and grossness? You know, we, we understand this. When we see it in a Hasidic perspective, it's talking about the self-refinement of it. We think, oh, wait, how could you ask me whatever? Well, because, what do you mean? We do this all the time. That's self-discipline, acting contrary to how I feel right now. Now, how do we do that? Because we know that the action is way more important than my feeling. And it has nothing to do with whether or not what you're feeling is valid. It's just, you got to pull yourself together. We, can't, we don't always give into what we feel. 
But prayer itself, it's a discipline because we want it to be a consistent sort of behavior. I got to keep acting according to the way that I know is how I should be behaving and not always just giving in to whatever I'm feeling right now. It's exerting great effort to refine and improve the character traits. Prayer, in addition to time of communicating with God, it's also a time of great introspection to be like, hey, am I on the right track right now? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? What can I focus on to fix it? And it's not going to take one prayer. It's going to take many prayers for that because again, we're exerting great effort for that. This is all the level of Shimon. So we have here, remember we said for Shema, this is what the level of Shimon relates to. This, this second paragraph of Baha'ya. And it will be, if you listen to my commandments that I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve with all your heart and with all your soul. We have love, that's your Uved. And to serve him, this is what we're going to focus on here, Avoda means to work, it's service. The Gemara takes this phrase, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart, which is the service of God that is performed in the heart. As in we say, service of the heart. What are we speaking about? Say to the Maratas, you must say, this is prayer. What is serving God from the heart? This is prayer. The emphasis here on the word of, of service, as a servant to a master, it's a place of fear. It's not a place of love. As we've learned already, fear aligns with the pathway of, of Shimon, right? This insignificance of man before the greatness of the creator. Not a fear of punishment or anything like that. It's saying I'm so small before something so great. I submit humility before him. Now, here we have, this is also from Hayom Yom. Know the God of your fathers and serve him with a whole heart. This is a verse that's been taken out. Every sort of Torah knowledge and comprehension, even the most profound, must be expressed in Avoda. So it's not enough to just learn Torah and have knowledge. What we want is you got to take the, what you've learned and you actually have to integrate it within yourself. You actually have to apply it. It's like Chachma Bina Das. Remember we did that? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. It's the application of knowledge. The process of applying this, it's called Avoda. So again, we're looking at this word Avoda as work i.e. it ed, that is, the intellectual attainment must bring about an actual refinement and improvement of character traits. Someone can know the entire Torah by heart, but if it doesn't affect them, then they haven't fully succeeded in their Torah study. Of course, sure, you're connected to God in the moment of that, but you got to keep going. Intellectual attainment must bring about an actual refinement and improvement of character traits and must be translated into a deep-rooted inward attachment to God, all of which is what the Hasidic lexicon calls avodah. Specifically from a Hasidic viewpoint, we speak about avoda. When we use this, this phrase avoda, we're specifically talking about it's not just enough to know, we actually have to apply. I don't, I don't remember if I told it over in this class. I was listening to, um, they had this thing from Robert Rabbi Jacobson, from Rabbi S. Jacobson. And he was talking about, if you remember, um, during the days of Sphira, counted between Pesach and Shavuos, especially in the beginning of it, it's a time of mourning because you have this whole thing that happened to Rabbi Kiva students, students were dying from a plague. And on Lag Omer, that's why they stopped dying. So that's part of why it's a day of great celebration. Also because the Rashbi said. So one of the things that he talked about, he said, how can we say that Rabbi Kiva's students? Rabbi Kiva said, Rabbi Kiva said, love your a fellow Jew like yourself. Loving your fellow as yourself is the entire Torah. The rest is commentary. What do you think he had 24,000 students that didn't get the message? Oh, I wonder what he's talking about today. Yeah. What do you think they didn't know? Not that they didn't know. His 24,000 students, and they passed away, they were great Torah scholars. You can imagine, he was like the academy of the rabbis, and he trained them, and they went out into the world, you know, and they, were, they talked. These are great leaders of the generation. They weren't just random people who picked them on the street. And if they were, he turned them into scholars. <laughs> we're talking about scholars here. They knew. What does Rabbi Akiva stand for? Like, it wasn't a true question. Everyone knew this is what he stood for. So I can say there's 24,000 students. Not only that, after the 24,000 students died, that they passed away from this plague, what did Rabbi Akiva do? He didn't, he didn't hand in the towel. He started training another set of students. He got another five students. And these five students, we know what their names are. Not only that, but these five students were Torah giants of the generation. We know who they are. We know what they taught. The 24,000 students, we don't have names for them. We don't know. By, by the way, one of those five students is, is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Zohar, right? And that's, I don't remember if he sourced where the teaching was from. One of the things that he was saying is because the 24,000 students, it's not that they didn't know that you're supposed to love your fellow Jew. It's the love of the fellow Jew. They got it wrong. Because like, oh, I care about you so much, you have to do Torah the way I understand Torah. Your way that you do Torah, it's wrong. And because I love you so much, I want to do this for you. You know, when you suffocate someone else in, with good intentions, it's kind of what it was. No, 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 you have to do it my way because this is the best way. Like, no, no, well, it's the best way for you. It's not, doesn't mean it's the best way for them. And still all following Torah. So it's not someone who's like, never mind, we don't need Torah right now, right? It's not, it's not like that. Everyone's still following Torah, but with their own pathways. And they couldn't handle you who I love so much, you, you have to follow the correct pathway. You have to. How does it connect? One of the things he was drawing down, they were all Torah scholars and still leaders, but the Torah didn't change them. The Torah didn't redefine them. It didn't refine them. It didn't redefine them. 
And that's how they can be led to such a state. Because the whole point of Torah learning is not just to amass knowledge and information in our brains. Torah, learning God's word, it's supposed to make us better people. It's supposed to refine us as people. It doesn't just happen. Like, oh, you know, I said a verse today, so I, I'm a different person now. It's something that requires real work, which obviously goes back to Tanya. Right? And part of this is also, well, my dad says a lot, or people, you know, that's why you have to differentiate between Jews and Judaism. Because Judaism is perfect, it's God word, it's got what God wants from us. Jews are human beings. We don't always get it right. And sometimes people, like, they'll get turned off, let's say, from, uh, like, very religious people who, who might appear rude or something like that. You might have met someone like that once or twice in your life. Even if you, we don't realize it consciously, subconsciously, what we're saying is, like, if a person is religious and you're following the Torah or whatever, like, shouldn't that be making you into a nicer person? Well, the answer is yes. Now, the fact that a person might not be there yet, that's because everybody's got their own thing going on. You know, so we're not going to point fingers and say, oh, he's, uh, he's really a sinner, even though he's religious, or take that out of the picture. If we are engaging in the journey, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, then Torah, it's not enough to, to just be doing a mitzvah. It's good, do a mitzvah. If you're not there yet, do the mitzvah. But it, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with just doing the mitzvah. It doesn't end with like, oh, I went to study today and I learned for four hours today. Good, but what did that do to you? How did you change from your four hours of, of Torah study? You have spent four hours, you have spent an hour, 15 minutes, whatever amount of time, engaged in, united with, totally surrounded with the light and the wisdom of God. You should not be the same person after that. This needs to affect you. And this is going to affect you if you actually have to put the work in for it. You can't just go to one of these like seminars, like a weight loss seminar. I attended the weight loss seminar. How come I'm the same way? You gotta apply it. You gotta do something about it. So Torah is the same thing. Learning Torah is good. Well, it's very good. And doing the mitzvah, fulfilling the mitzvahs are very good. But there, there's supposed to be an application that occurs. There's supposed to be something that Torah has to, is supposed to change us. It's supposed to refine us as people. Torah takes us, the physical form, the material body is coal, and Torah is trying to chip away to reveal the diamond underneath. That's what Torah is supposed to do. It wants to, I'm going to let it shine. We're going to shine. How do you shine? Well, you got you to work. You got to chip away at it. You got to clean it up. This is why it's called a voda. It's called a work, tanning the hide. It's a very uh, direct language. It's a strong language. You got to work for it. Torah study by itself is not enough. It's good, but it's not the end of it. It's supposed to change us as people. Okay, going back to this, this is applied through, through prayer, associated more with the, the pathway of fear. So this is Shimon. This is the pillar of Shimon. So not just that the world is sustained through prayer, oh, we pray to God, whatever, but prayer is supposed to be a time for us to focus on refining ourselves. How are we going to become better people? What am I going to work on? And then we have the last of the three pillars. That's the pillar of Torah. And Torah, as we've done before, so Torah is Levi. Torah is attachment. It's also why it's the middle column. Torah includes both love and fear. First of all, I love God so much, I'm going to unite with him. And then fear because we are subjugating ourselves to a higher knowledge. We are subjugating ourselves to something that's above us and beyond us. We're not coming into Torah study to show how brilliant we are. If we are, then we're not coming into Torah study with the right kind of approach. It's good to still study the Torah, but this is not the, the truly right approach to Torah study. The approach of Torah study is subjugating ourselves. And I submit to what God has to say. I yield to his greater knowledge. First of all, it's a, that's a moment of humility. To yield is to not be so much me anymore. This is the starting point now for Torah study. And we also have, if you remember, the prayer that aligned with Levi. Behaft Hashem al is Reuven, Bahayim Shmoa is Shimon. And Levi is this thing of Yatz true and enduring and beautiful and all that kind of, right? It had all these expressions. Mm -hmm. So if you actually look at it, Yatz of Nacham, the kind of Yashar, etc., 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 there's 15 words in a row that all start with the letter Vav. The letter Vav, the V, Vyatz of the kind of Yashar, the vav there, it's and. It's a conjunction, junction, what's your function? It has it 15 times the vav. And is a language of attachment and joining. Again, to emphasize how Levi Torah study, this column, this pillar is, is attachment, unification. This is what Torah is. Not just that the world is upheld by Torah, because the world was created for Torah, so we got to keep studying Torah. We sustain its existence through Torah. This is what the world feeds off of, Torah study, mitzvahs. But not just for us personally, this is a level of attachment. We've seen this already. Tanya tells us, This is the most wonderful unity, that there is no unity similar or palatine in the physical realm. This is the column, the pillar of Levi. Attachment. Torah study, which is attachment. And attachment blends together both love and fear. Love you so much, and I, am, I have submitted myself to you. Now we go back to Yehuda. Not just going back to Yehuda, now we go back to the original verse that we started everything with. Well, this is the first part of the verse. Yehuda, ata yiducha achecha. Yehuda, as for you, you, your brothers will acknowledge you. What does it mean your brothers will acknowledge you? So Yehuda is the fourth brother, your brothers will acknowledge you. Because the first three brothers, the first three levels of divine service, these are the first three 
rungs on the ladder leading up to the level of Yehuda. Not just that, why do we have the word of acknowledgement is because if you remember what Leah said, this time I'm going to thank God, give acknowledgement and thanks. You can't give thanks without acknowledgement. I'm going to give thanks to God is because she didn't expect to have more than three sons. And now she had a fourth son. That's beyond what she, it's almost like beyond what the natural order was supposed to be. Which is also why Yehudah represents something that's beyond the natural order of things. Beyond what the, conf the confines of nature. Yehuda is this level of, your brothers will acknowledge you, we're now entering a level of total submission. A level of totally giving ourselves over before him. And that's a level that's beyond our own intellect. So that's what you have. Yehuda is parallel to that Amida prayer. The Amida prayer, we stand in one place, we don't talk. It's a very holy time, very quiet introspective time. Well, it's not just introspective. And it says in the Gemara, like, how are we supposed to stand at a time of, of this? Is Ka'avda Kame Murray. Serving before his master. How do you stand at a time like this? Like a servant before his master. Not in the sense of fear. It sounds a little bit like Shimon, but wait, we're going, we're going further than that. Only through mastering the first three levels within reason and understanding. The first three brothers, it's all within the level of intellect and, and reason and rational, all that other sort of stuff. But the thing about intellect is that it's subjective. The thing about intellect is that it's mine, it's personal. It is connected to me as an I am. I think, therefore I am. Chazidus is like, yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> I think, therefore I am, is, is establishing yourself as an entity. We want to unestablish ourselves as an entity. Not because we're worthless, but because we are standing for the presence of so much greatness. <laughs> because of what we can achieve when we go beyond ourselves. So, oh, how do you transcend limitations? You know how you transcend limitations? You stop thinking. How many times were you like, you want, you were going to make a jump or something? You jump across a river, you're going to do something that for you was like a big move. What did everyone tell you? Stop thinking and just do it. Ever heard it before? It's been said. Just do it, okay? Just do it. Why stop thinking? Because your own mind holds you back. Your own mind tells you what can or can't according to what. Well, no, no, no. We're not moving backwards by not thinking. We're moving forward without without thinking. By stopping to think right now, you've maximized what your personal opinion is. And now, to bust you out of the limitations of your personal opinion, we're going to stop thinking. And we're going to go beyond that. That's the level of Yehuda. The level that goes beyond all that. And that's why it's a much higher level of divine service that we could achieve. Because you have done so much, right? You, you tanned your hide. <laughs> you have tanned your hide. You have love. You have tanning. You did attachment. And you are now on this incredibly high level. Yet, all those levels were achieved through your own capacities, which are incredible, and you have achieved so much. And now, now we're going to go a step beyond that. You need the first three brothers to bring you to that point. You don't just jump up to the fourth step. This is a work that you've got to do. You cannot reach the fourth step without mastering the steps that come before it. Only through mastering the first three levels within reason and understanding, as in only through maximizing, true maximizing of our potentials, of our capacities, can the level of Yehuda be reached. It's a level of transcending limitations of the intellectual faculties to attain this level of acknowledgement, submission, and self nullification What we mean by self nullification is not like not self erasure. self nullification means that my self, my ego self, that's what's going to be nullified. I know Reverend Chase Taub says a lot. You've heard from other people that ego is edging God out. So when we talk about self nullification it's putting down the ego. It's moving aside the ego. There's no sense of self because the more of a self I am, it basically creates a self-centeredness. No, self-centeredness means that you have you don't have space for other people. The level of Yehuda gets us to that level. And we see that, which, wrapping up with this one, this last phrase, which is actually also from Perki Abos, from a later part. And it says, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Shloshe Kisar Mehen, Kesek Torah, V'chesek Kuna, V'chesek Malchos, V'chesek Shen Tov, Ola Agaben. Rabbi Shimon would say, there are three crowns. The crown of Torah, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of sovereignty. Malchos, like kingship. There is a parallel of how like the three pillars that we spoke about before align with these three crowns. But we're not going to do that now. But what does it say? The crown of a good name surmounts them all. The crown of a good name is even higher than all three of them. Here specifically we have, quote unquote, the crowns, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. And what's even higher than all of them, that's going to be the crown of Yehuda. Which, we're going to get more into that and see how that actually is next time when we wrap up the Bible.